the Dean of the College of Science uh, here at Northeastern. And uh, it's my, my honor to, to welcome you all. And, to, and we're obviously here tonight to hear Sylvia Earle, uh, legendary, I have to say, um, explorer, scientist, conservationist. So thank you for coming. And we're all looking forward to hearing from her. And thank you to Sylvia for coming to do this for us. This is a, a kickoff event for us for a, <clears throat> a conference we'll hold tomorrow on the subject of urban coastal sustainability. Uh, I came to Northeastern about two and a half years ago because of a tremendous opportunity to hire faculty. Uh, and the university is on a great journey with a very positive momentum. And uh, the ability to hire faculty on a substantial scale to me was very exciting because it allows us to figure out where science is going and how we can bring the university research to the cutting edge in certain areas. And we all know that you can't do everything. So the issue is to choose <clears throat> some areas where you think you have a chance of really being a global leader. So emerging from a lot of discussions with the faculty, one of the most obvious opportunities lay in this area of cities by the sea, the massive challenges facing places like Boston and the fact that a very large fraction of the population of the world lives within 25 miles of the sea. And the, the driven by global change, climate change, uh, it really sets up a, a series of tremendous challenges for our continuing sustainability. And we felt because we have here a, a, a lot of interesting things, but one very unique capability on which we're building. And we're going to show you a, sh a quick movie about that. It's called the Marine Science Center. It's out in Nahant, which is about 20 miles away. And it's one of the very few uh, marine science centers that is located on a city by on an ocean. And so it's very well suited for studies of this kind. And, and so we have chosen to use that as the focus of our initiative. And we've already hired, thanks to the leadership, by the way, of Jeffrey Trussell, who unfortunately would really wanted to be here today, but things beyond his control have prevented that from being the case. But Jeff is the leader of the Marine Science Center in the Department of Marine Environmental Science. We've hired a, a half a dozen faculty already, and to build on the dozen we already have to start to create this, this expertise which is going to connect very strongly with other parts of the university in engineering, law, policy, business, and so on. So I'd like to show you just a brief, we, we could have held the event at Nahant, but it's not very practical. Uh, we thought that to get you back to dinner might be a little bit too long at this time of day. So instead, we're going to show you a brief movie about the Marine Science Center. So if you could start that. There are very few marine labs, places like it anywhere in the country or in the world, where you can walk right across the lawn and be in the field working on a rocky shoreline, an exposed rocky shoreline like this one. So that's what really drew me to this place, and it's one of the things that I absolutely love about it. The Urban Coastal Sustainability Initiative emerged from our strategic planning when I first came as the Dean of the College of Science. We're seeking some really no-brainer ideas for areas where we could, we could sort of take leadership, world leadership um, in our hiring. We had the ability to hire a lot of faculty and we wanted to be strategic about hiring in areas that could really make a difference. So one of the very obvious ones was to build on the existing Marine Science Center. The main reason we should focus on uh, urban coastal sustainability issues is because the vast majority of the world's population lives along coastal ecosystems. Uh, over half of the world's gross domestic e uh, product is produced in coastal environments or adjacent to them. So there's clear economic value to understanding uh, how sustainability is going to be important moving forward. I see the, you know, the urban coastal sustainability initiative you know, being a very broad initiative uh, where Northeastern's taking a leadership role and really pushing the envelope on what we can contribute um, as a, as a, you know, leaders in the area of sustainability research. And I see my um, role in that is connecting with the range of scientists we've brought in here to push us to be leaders in the, in the realm of fisheries uh, sustainability. All right, you guys ready to go? 
a huge portion of the world's population, especially in the U.S., lives in coastal areas, and, and more and more people are moving towards coastal zones. It, it puts stress on the ecosystems, but it also points to the importance of how the ecosystems in the coastal environment um, benefit society. And so in, in the Boston area, we have this, this really unique opportunity to look at how this, this coupled human natural system works, um, how we can move forward uh, in a way that works both for the natural environment and for the built environment um, in ways that are both ecologically and economically sound. I think the Urban and Coast Coastal Sustainability Initiative is um, ideally suited for, for Northeastern in this area because, um, you know, obviously this is an urban area, but you come out to the MSC and um, there are these amazing coastal habitats that we can do research on. Um, and then there are also so many uh, additional um, research institutions in the area to collaborate with. It just provides a great um, nexus for collaboration. One of the main reasons that I came to Northeastern University is the ability to do work here. You know, most of my work is focused at understanding processes and dynamics on the shoreline and the ability to merge the work I do here in the lab at the Marine Science Center with being able to go right out here on the shore and conduct experiments is an incredibly powerful tool. Students and their involvement is critical. In this case, we have a new marine biology major that we introduced just a couple of years ago, which clearly strongly connects with the MSC and the Urban Coastal Sustainability Initiative. But we're also um, looking at opportunities for the students to do co-op, both in research labs. So we've hired more faculty, therefore there's more research activity going on in this area, more opportunities for students to do research experience, both as internships and co-ops. We've uh, just uh, formed this new graduate program in ecology, evolution, and marine biology. This is the first of what we hope are multiple graduate programs that are going to focus on our goals of becoming an academic and research leader in environmental studies and in environmental science and marine science uh, more broadly. So one of the, th the things scientists have tried to do in recent years are restore the habitats that were naturally along the coastlines and oyster reefs were one of the great examples of these. They provide lots of benefits for societies like fish and a harvestable oyster itself, but they also protect the shoreline. Non-researchers can always, um, you know, come out and learn more about what we're doing. Some people find it's interesting to, um, you know, volunteer, come in the field, just check things out and learn more about it. The worst thing would be if we, we kept this within the academic community. We, we have to reach out um, to everyone else as well. We really need people that are passionate about environmental issues uh, to really join with us and help us uh, move this forward because I can promise you um, that we'll make them proud of their investment in us. So you can see from this slide that we uh, view the Marine Science Center as kind of the jewel in the crown for this initiative. It really leverages heavily with partnering with the rest of the university to bring these, to solve these really tremendous challenges. You need policy and law and architecture and, and uh, uh, engineering and many other fields. And of course, we want to partner with other institutions. And so this is, I think, one of the reasons that we focused on MSC in our initial activities here and why we invited Sylvia tonight to talk. So I'd like to hand over now to the, <clears throat> the Senior Vice President and Provost of the University, Stephen Director, who will introduce Sylvia. Thanks, Murray, and I too would like to welcome all of you uh, to this evening's uh, kickoff event for this uh, Sustaining Coastal Cities Conference that we have here. Uh, I think that the video you just saw certainly captures uh, our, and, and demonstrates our commitment to sustainability as one of the most important disciplines uh, that we can support. Uh, many of you that know the university, you know a few years ago we decided to focus on three major university-wide themes, uh, interdisciplinary themes, uh, and 
sustainability in general and urban coastal sustainability in particular was one of, the, one of those themes. Uh, and as Murray pointed out, we're, we're hiring faculty in these areas, we're focusing our, our research in this, these areas and, and building infrastructure such as the one you saw in, in this video. Uh, we, we're pleased that so many of you are here tonight and we hope that you will participate in the events uh, tomorrow. Uh, it's now my pleasure, and Murray gives me the honor of introducing uh, Dr. Sylvia Earle, National Geographic Society Explorer in Residence. Uh, Dr. Earle has devoted her professional life to understanding our ocean planet and searching for ways for us to be better stewards of the planet, and we certainly need to do that. Uh, Sylvia has been called many, many things, I'm told. Uh, the things that I can tell you that she's been called are her deepness by the New Yorker and the New York Times, a living legend by the Library of Congress, and hero for the planet by Time Magazine. And I think that gives you the picture. She has led numerous expeditions, both above and below the surface of the sea, uh, she's lived for weeks of her life on the ocean floor in underwater habitats, most recently this past July when she helped save Noah's underwater habitat, Aquarius. Uh, she was the first chief scientist for NOAA and led a five-year sustainable seas expedition that documented changes and conditions in all of the national marine sanctuaries of the United States. She's also led the first team of women aquanauts uh, during the Tech Kite project in 1970 and holds numerous records in underwater exploration. A special focus is on developing a global network of areas on land and in the ocean to safeguard the living system that provides the underpinnings of global processes for maintaining biodiversity and yielding basic life support services to providing stability and resiliency in response to accelerating climate change. She has more than 100 national and international honors, including the 2011 Royal Geographical Society Gold Medal, the 2011 Medal of Honor from the Dominican Republic, uh, and also the Netherlands Order of the Golden Ark. There's many others as well. She's the founder of Deep Ocean Exploration and Research Incorporated, founder of Mission Blue and Sea Alliance. You get to sleep sometimes too, I would assume. And chair of the advisory councils of the Hart Research Institute and, uh, the o and the Ocean in Google Earth. She holds a bachelor's degree from Florida State University, MS and PhDs from Duke University, and she also holds 22 honorary degrees. She's authored more than 190 scientific, uh, technical, and popular publications and lectured in more than 80 countries and has also appeared on numerous television shows and heard over m many radio stations as well. It's truly an honor, Sylvia, to have you join us tonight. I ask all of you to please join me in welcoming Sylvia Earle to the podium. Thank you. It is truly an honor to be here with you this afternoon and evening. There's one small omission from that grand introduction. You failed to mention that I'm a Boston Sea Rover. <laughs> <laughs> Since the 1960s. <laughs> so, yes, I have some deepish roots here. I lived in Boston for, oh, more than five years. I had a little nest over uh, on, in Boston and at, the, at Harvard, that other institution around the corner. <laughs> and I've been involved with Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution for many years as well. And just so many friends here. I suppose it's natural because, you know, we're all drawn to the sea one way or the other. And this place, this whole northeastern sweep of communities, well, you know, it just so closely aligned 
to the past, present, and future of our relationship to the ocean. When I was a kid, I read William Beebe's book about diving, where he said, whatever it is that you have to do, beg, borrow, and he even did say, steal. <laughs> a, a helmet. He, was, he didn't know about face masks or scuba tanks at the time because it was pre-Cousteau. And I never got to meet William Beebe or his partner in developing the first system that enabled human beings to go as much as half a mile beneath the surface, Otis Barton. But I was mesmerized at the descriptions of what the ocean is like, and it really made it so clear to me that the ocean is more than just water, that the ocean is not just rocks and water, it's alive. And I brought a little video clip, one that you can see if you look at the ocean in Google Earth, it's there as one of the a dozen or so little clips that show parts of the ocean around the world. So could we show that little clip just as a good way to jump in? Intensely blue, the waters around Bermuda are warmed by the Gulf Stream, one of the world's largest and swiftest ocean currents. Humpback whales pass through these waters each year, migrating from polar feeding grounds. These waters are also known to legions of luminous deep sea creatures and intrepid undersea explorers. In the 1930s, zoologist William Beebe and engineer Otis Barton descended a thousand meters into the depths around Bermuda for a first view of life in a place the sunlight never reaches. Beebe compared what he saw to naked space itself, out far beyond atmosphere, between the stars, where the blackness of space, the shining planets, comets, suns, and stars must really be closely akin to the world of life as it appears to the eyes of an old human being in the open ocean, one half mile down. For Beebe and Barton, the comets, suns, and stars were living creatures reflecting rainbows of iridescence, or flashing, sparkling, and glowing with their own living light. Fireflies and glowworms are famous light makers on the land, but in the deep sea, about 90% of the creatures, jellies, fish, bacteria, shrimp, squids, and many others, have some form of bioluminescence to signal one another. Scientists say these bursts of starry light may be the most common form of communication on the planet. In the open sea, jellies are also among the most abundant forms of life. The Gulf Stream current can carry these oddly beautiful drifters along at about 160 kilometers a day. Buffered by the Gulf Stream is a magically quiet, gently rotating mass of sargassum weed that expands over more than five million square kilometers of open waters. Isolated by walls of fast-moving currents between Bermuda and Puerto Rico, the Sargasso Sea holds a liquid jungle of creatures which have evolved over the ages to exist in floating forests of golden brown sargassum. Within its leafy, sunlit masses are camouflaged such creatures as loggerhead turtles, filefish, sea hares, and the speckled brown sargasso crab. For scientists, it's a living laboratory, strategically located in the open sea. For creatures that live in the undersea caves, among the reefs, and in the great depths below, Bermuda is simply home. So since Beebe's time, he made these historic dives into the Sargasso Sea of Bermuda in the 1930s, before I was born. But before most of you were born, actually, but consider what's happened since then. 
if Bibi could just imagine this view of Earth. What an exciting concept it has been. I mean, my parents were born long before people could imagine going to the moon, let alone looking back and seeing this little blue speck in, in space. Since I've been around, since all of us have, have been around, even 10-year-olds, we are living at the most extraordinary point in all of human history. During this time, it's safe to say that we've learned more about the ocean than during all preceding human history put together. The humans have been around for quite a while. How do you measure? Is it two, three million years? Is it the last 10,000 years since the height of the last ice age when our prosperity has really come into focus, when cities began to be formed? And here we are today, 1800, it was one billion people. When I arrived, there were about two billion. Now we have seven billion people. And as it was pointed out in earlier remarks, a great majority of occupied space for humankind tends to be close to where water is, rivers, lakes, streams, and certainly the ocean. I mean, it's obvious why. It's water. Water is the key. No water, no life. No blue, no green, to coin a phrase. This is, in some ways, the sweet spot in all of human history. You know, engineers, they work and work and work, trying to get gears to mesh, and finally they get it right. That's the sweet spot. But if they keep at it too long and go too far about certain things, it gets away from that sweet spot. I think this moment, this time, because never before have we been able to see ourselves like this. Never before have we been able to connect the dots the way we can at this point in history. Every generation, of course, learns from what happened in previous times. It's astonishing what we now know that our grandparents, let alone our great-grandparents, or those who were around a thousand years ago, could know. Even the smartest people who were around early in the 20th century or long before, think of the great minds of, in the past, could not know what 10-year-olds carry around in their pockets with a cell phone or an iPad or whatever it is, the device that enables us to connect with knowledge and with one another all over the world. Cause for hope. Like the conference that's, that you're launching here tomorrow to reflect on where have we been? Who are we anyway, we human beings? Able for the first time in all of planetary history to alter the nature of nature. We're doing it. We didn't even know that was possible when I was a kid. The ocean was simply too big to fail. We could put into the sky whatever we wanted to, we thought, without consequences. The ocean, the ultimate dump site, deep sixing things into the sea to get rid of things we didn't want close to where we live. But now we know. And this conference tomorrow, I think, great cause for hope, because now we know. We're asking the right questions. How can we find an enduring place for ourselves within the natural systems that keep us alive? It's putting us in perspective. We've always thought of ourselves as the center of the universe. I mean, Galileo was given a bit of a hard time about trying to change that perspective. But it still exists. It does. It's all about us. It's all about us now. But fortunately, the sweet spot in time, for the first time, we're able to think about things in different ways to look out into the universe beyond and see, well, what are the other options? Can we get on spacecraft and zoom off and set up housekeeping in Mars? Well, I expect we will, but not for seven billion people, let alone 10. And first of all, we have to make peace with the blue one on the left before we can even imagine responsibly doing anything elsewhere, whether it's the moon or Mars or some distant place that may at this point, seem even less likely than today. I love these efforts now underway to have one-way trips to Mars. 
<laughs> Anybody in here going to volunteer? <laughs> Some are prepared to pay big bucks for the privilege of committing suicide in space. Well, here's the thing. There are a lot of people who want to go into space. I think it's a great idea. I think we should send a lot of people up there. <laughs> One way. <laughs> but the idea that we can maybe terraform Mars, make the red planet more like the blue one, to you know, grow plants, to somehow get the water out of the rocks. Even the idea of sending a few of us up there means we have to be very mindful of our life support system because the atmosphere is largely carbon dioxide, much like it is thought that the early atmosphere of Earth was before little green things started to grow and put oxygen into the atmosphere, take up carbon dioxide, been doing a really good job of it. So we have a planet that works for us. We have an atmosphere of 20% or so of oxygen and just enough carbon dioxide to drive photosynthesis to keep the process going. Only now we've sort of tilted the odds a bit a little too much CO2. In fact, huh, perversely, while some are looking to terraform Mars, unwittingly, we're Marsiforming Earth. More carbon dioxide than there was when I was a kid, or when our great grandparents were a kid, or 1,000 or 10,000 years ago, owing to our actions in the last 200, and especially the last 50, and the pace is picking up despite what we know about the need to do otherwise. And just last week, we just crossed that line, 400 parts per thousand CO2 in the atmosphere. What are we thinking when we know what we know? Well, tomorrow's conference is really going to look at these issues. What are we thinking? What? Are we thinking? <laughs> we are thinking about how do we make a go of it. The economist is thinking about the ocean, thinking about the environment. We're seeing for the first time, largely in the last 10 years, and the pace there is picking up too, of the economic interests taking seriously the environmental interests. And at the same time, those who care about the nature of nature, linking it to the economic interests, understanding that it's not polar opposites. In fact, we've got to pull together a sound environment means a sound economy. A sound economy means you've got to have a sound environment. Or as Tim Worth puts it, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. It is. And look, we're seeing the consequences of not paying rapt attention to what we're doing to the natural systems that keep us alive. Sandy is an example, but there are other examples before them. It's not as if we don't know. We human beings have this gift of being able to review the past, to put ourselves in context, and to look at the future. And we can draw a line from here to here to here to here and anticipate what's going to happen. Now, that there are a lot of smart creatures on the planet other than humans. Cats, dogs, some birds, Elephants, dolphins, whales, squids, stomatopods. If you don't know what that is, you should look it up because they're really smart, engaging creatures. But they cannot know what we know. They can't do what humans can do. And that's good and that's also not good. <laughs> but we have the gift and we have, fortunately, the gift of time. Not a lot but enough to figure things out and go forward. And we have the gift of being able to see, as no other creature can see, that the ocean dominates the planet. And we're beginning, really just beginning, to take seriously the need to explore. And certainly to explore, ideally before we exploit further what's out there. Knowing that the ocean governs climate, weather, drives the water cycle, drives the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, the sulfur cycle. What is it that you zero in on and think about as important in terms of our life support system? You have to think ocean. 
you have to think water, especially the ocean, since that's where 97% of water is. And now we're beginning to take the plunge. Now, I guess humans have always looked to the sea and longingly wished to know what was below, but it is really basically on our watch in our time that for the first time we're able to realize that dream. I love the fact that I've come along at a time when it's possible to, you know, have a face mask. Even William Beebe didn't have a face mask, didn't have flippers. Something as simple as that. Although Leonardo da Vinci designed flippers, he didn't have the materials to follow through, to make some of the things that he imagined. He even imagined a submarine. And perhaps if he had the right materials and the right incentive, there would be submarines back in his day. And we might be further ahead, <laughs> further down than we are presently. But anyway, why not enjoy what we do have? Millions of divers out there exploring the ocean, seeing with their own eyes what's in the sea. Going back to 1970, for the first time, I had a chance to not just dive, to go down to 50 meters or so, but to stay underwater and experience the gift of time, to be able to stay long enough, day and night, to stay and see the creatures who live in the sea, and get to know them as individuals. Well, now, thanks to an invitation from Mark Patterson, who's in the audience, <laughs> and some of his buddies, I got to enjoy my 10th time living underwater just last July, August, where we spent a week in this latest and greatest of the undersea laboratories. Going back to the 70s, there were about 50 that had been developed and deployed in various parts of the world. And they were used to great advantage in the oil and gas industry, and they still are. The whole idea of saturation diving, staying underwater long enough so that the compressed gas that you breathe, whether it's air or a mix of gases, that your tissues become saturated with it, and then it takes hours to come back to the surface. If you stay long enough, deep enough, it may take days or weeks to come back to surface conditions. But meanwhile, you have the gift of time, the ability to just stay in the water hours at a time. And last summer, at least one of our, our intrepid crew spent as much as 12 hours, half the day and at night, actually out in the sea. And that's the whole point of it. You don't go in the underwater hotel laboratory, whatever it is, access to the sea, just to sleep inside and look out the window. You go so you can get outside and swim around to be with the creatures who are there on their own terms. We were using some fan fancy new helmets last summer. I've only used rebreathers or air tanks and the typical face mask until last summer. But with this, we have the ability, because it was wired back to the underwater laboratory and thus had communication. We had email underwater. <laughs> no, <laughs> no refuge from that, unfortunately, or fortunately. But we could talk to those on the surface. And I actually turned out to be a Zen moment on the Jon Stewart show because they took images of this and I'd made some little murmury things. And I did a little interview for Fox News live from the bottom of the sea. We did a Google Hangout from inside. You know, it's just the new ways of sharing the view. The best part of it is that liquid door through which you pass in and out. It seemed like magic the first time I experienced this. And there's my dive buddy coming in from an excursion. I think you're coming in instead of going out. <laughs> Hard to tell. There, I mean, you look down and there's a swimming pool right on the floor of your underwater laboratory. You'd say, well, why doesn't the water come in? Well, it's because there's pressure inside that keeps the water from burbling in. I guess it has happened occasionally in the history of underwater laboratories when the pressure inside gets a little too light and water does start to creep in. But generally speaking, this 
is the way it's supposed to be. There's a hot shower, microwave oven, peanut butter, as much as you can tolerate, uh, a nice uh, refrigerator. People bring M&Ms to you, a special delivery. And you can write your notes. There's a laboratory with microscopes, computers. It's truly a place where you can use the ocean as the laboratory. That's what I love about it. Sponges that you don't have to haul from the bottom of the ocean into a surface laboratory. That's good. You can get a lot of things done that way. But to bring yourself down to where the sponge or the coral or the fish or whatever it is that is the creature of your choice and see them the way they naturally live. They behave differently, believe it or not. It seems logical to me when they're just happy there on the ocean floor instead of being hauled out to your convenience to a distant place that is not exactly the way they would have it. And the fish look in to see you while you are looking out to see them. It's like being in the aquarium. Maybe that's why they call it the Aquarius. So cool. There are six of us, actually. We only got four of us crammed around the porthole for this nice picture. But we had such a good time actually living on what they call the electrified reef, because power exists, of course. And instruments can be put out underwater, adapted for use in the sea, new ways of gathering information real time, in situ, as they say. It's an idea that is taking off all over the world, having instrumentation, sensors, observation stations in the sea, whether they're, they include scientists or not. We're learning so much now that we couldn't learn before we had the technology that enables us to do what we now are able to do. We just have to amp it up. And I'm so pleased that this university is doing exactly that. Aquarius has been sitting out there on the reef now in near Key Largo for 20 years. So it's become a part of the reef, with it becoming home for the creatures that live there. There are little fish that actually set up housekeeping and lay their eggs, damselfish, on the outside of Aquarius, and corals that have sprouted up all over. And it just, it just looks like a big, special part of the reef, this giant grouper has decided that it's just a nice place to hang out. But the thing is, there are 20 years now of data gathered by some of the best and brightest scientists from around the world, including astronauts who've come to use this as a place to train for the experience of being in space, which was true going back to the beginning of saturation diving in the 60s with George Bond with the US Navy and with the Tech Type program that was partly funded by NASA. And what we've done since the 1960s to access the skies above and the commitment that we've made, think big B billions of dollars, it's really paid off handsomely, but we've neglected the ocean and it's costing us dearly. If we put an equal amount huh, in this part of the universe, understanding this part of the solar system that we can get to a little more readily than going to Mars. Think of what we could know about the history of the universe. It's right here under our feet. It's right here, the ocean itself and what's below. We're getting there. I'm so pleased to be around when we're awakening to the reality of the need to explore our own blue speck in the universe. Now, going back 50 years ago, coral reefs in the area where Aquarius is now located tended to look like this. Elkhorn and staghorn coral was really abundant. So were the conchs, after which conch reef was named where Aquarius is situated. The fish were much more abundant and some say, well, fish need coral and coral need fish. And if you take away the fish, 
coral reefs are more susceptible, more less resistant, less resilient to warming and other factors that cause the bleaching of coral. Something that's really been notable globally since the 1980s. Really, 1980 was a, a turning point in terms of remarkable occurrences of these bleaching events associated with warming. But already, the reefs had been depleted of lobsters, the spiny lobsters, not the ones with the big claws that are so prevalent and yummy from this part of the world. Lobsters here are important to the systems too, of course, not just the people side of things, but keeping the ocean healthy as well. Well, we didn't know, we didn't know what we now know about how important it is to think about complete systems. Didn't realize that extracting large quantities of fish from the sea could affect whole ecosystems, including the way the world itself functions, and back to us, back to our need to think about the ocean as our life support system. Today, about half of the coral reefs are gone or are in a state of sharp decline as compared to what they were when I was a kid. So that's the bad news. The good news is about half the coral reefs around the world are still in pretty good shape. That's the good news. They're not gone. But if you follow the projection, here's where we were, here's where they are, where are we going to be in the middle of this century? Some say, inevitably, if we continue doing what we're doing now with increased CO2 in the atmosphere, increased stuff that we put in the ocean with dead zones, especially where people live in coastal areas, a decrease in phytoplankton, some say as much as 40% missing since 1950, maybe it's only 30%, but even if it's 10%, we want to protect the plankton because it generates at least half, some say as much as 70% of the oxygen in the atmosphere. So, I mean, if you like to breathe, you'll take care of the ocean, you'll take care of the plankton, you'll take care of coral reefs, you'll take care of the fish, you'll take care of the systems that keep us alive. And for the conference taking place tomorrow, where we look at where people live close to the sea, it's so much easier to understand the human connection to the ocean because it's right there. But we haven't really understood that connection until right about now, this sweet spot in time. Fish in the Florida Keys were much more abundant when I was a kid, 30 years before Aquarius was placed at Conch Reef. Big grouper used to be out even where I could go wading along the shore as a kid. I could see these giant fish around the world. You know the numbers. If you haven't heard, you know, the decline is as with coral reefs. Sometimes it's only like 50%, but in some species, 90% of many of the big fish are gone. The story of what's happened to cod in this part of the world is something that we should really pay attention to. You know, we are the primary driver of changing the nature of nature on the land and in the sea. So we should listen to the fish. If they could talk, huh, if they could vote, mm. <laughs> what would our policies be if fish could vote? If they could tell us what the world is like from their perspective, what might we do differently? Not only if they talked, but if we listened. They would tell us, among other things, that it isn't just about coral reefs. Fish need coral reefs, those that live in coral reefs, or kelp forests, but it's a two-way street. The corals need the fish, the kelp forests need the fish, the great seagrass meadows, it's all an interactive, it's a city, if you will, underwater. Think of the entire ocean as a great big blue community of life with various areas where certain species prosper, but it all links together. So if you want to have a healthy coral reef, you better think about the mangroves, you better think about the seagrass meadows, you better think about the adjacent deep sea, better think about the quality of water itself now being affected 
by the excess carbon dioxide entering the ocean, turning the ocean in recent years to a more acidic state, which means everything's going to change one way or the other. Change the chemistry of the ocean, you change everything. And we are changing the chemistry of Earth through our actions. Well, I was oblivious to most of this when I had a chance in 1979, just on the edge of that time when we became shockingly aware of our impacts on coral reefs and the bleaching phenomenon that began to be noticed widely around the world at that time. When I had a chance to walk on the ocean floor at 400 meters beneath the surface of the ocean, it was such a cool thing to be able to do. I wrapped myself in a submarine, if you will, one atmosphere, no decompression. It's the next step beyond living underwater because with even the most sophisticated means of breathing compressed gases, we're only able to go as much as a thousand feet conveniently, and not everybody can do that. Some, under experimental circumstances, have gone to 2,000 feet, breathing, breathing helium, oxygen, and a little bit of nitrogen. The average depth of the ocean, two and a half miles. Maximum, seven miles. You know, right offshore from where we are here, you can quickly get to 1,000 feet. You can get down to 2,000 feet. You can go out into the center part of the Atlantic Ocean, even within our exclusive economic zone, out 200 miles, you can get into very deep water very fast. And the deeper you go, the less we know about who lives there and what we're doing to the ocean. When I had a chance, going back to 1970, for the first time to live underwater, it was at the same time that astronauts were walking on the moon. Ha! It was such excitement at that time about what goes up and also our ability to go into the sea. It seemed like a great new era of exploration skyward and seaward in parallel. And as I say, we have continued to go off into the sky, but even there we are losing our way, cutting back on exploration of the skies above, and certainly we're cutting back on exploring the oceans below. Cannot believe that some said that the mission that Mark Patterson and our buddies and I shared last July was the last mission of Aquarius. So it turns out they were wrong. That a heroic effort on the part of people who care, putting together a foundation to enable that system to keep going with some modest support from NOAA Taxpayer money, but it's well spent. Every penny is squeezed until it really does a terrific job of making our access to the sea possible. It's the only underwater laboratory now in the ocean serving science. There is a little underwater hotel not too far away in Key Largo where you can spend the night if you wish, but to actually use the ocean as a laboratory, we need systems such as Aquarius, and we need to take ourselves in little submarines, an idea whose time is overdue. Now, it was in the 60s that Alvin was hatched at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and soon it will plunge back into the sea again. It is truly the workhorse of undersea vehicles, and hundreds of scientists have been given a chance to see what goes on in the deep sea, but it is like having one Jeep for all of North America or most of the ocean. We are really living at this exciting time when we have the technology, we have the skill, we need the will to go with it. I was so frustrated going back to 1980. I started first one, then two, and ultimately a third company to build submarines. Huh. So far, succeeded only in building three in all this time, but a lot of little robots, especially now with the new company, deep ocean exploration and research that my daughter and son-in-law own and operate, but this was the first product from deep ocean engineering. A little submarine that can go to down where William Beebe and Otis Barton went in the 1930s. I mean, true, you can see out of this one much more readily than Beebe and Barton could out of their tiny little porthole, 
but we still haven't progressed that much. <laughs> the one thing that, that was good, I mean, we didn't have a tether going back to the surface, whereas BB and Barton had to, it was like being on a yo-yo. When the ship went up and down, so did the little bathosphere. This one, deep rover, is free in the sea. And it's so simple to drive that even a scientist can do it. <laughs> and I'm living proof. This is another variation. There are about 20 of these little guys, the deep workers that are built in Canada. We use this for the five-year sustainable seas expeditions. And here's a remarkable thing. Greenpeace, this feisty conservation organization, is leasing these subs to go out and do things like, let's go see what happened after the Deepwater Horizon spill. Let's go off into the canyons of Alaska and check out what the fishermen, the impact is, or let's just go see what's there because nobody knows. NOAA should have systems like this, like a garage full. The, the Coast Guard should, so they can go out and rescue whatever. They have ships on the surface, airplanes in the sky. What about the equipment? to just take off and explore the ocean. I mean, it is an idea whose time has come, overdue. We need Hertz Renesubs. <laughs> we need to be able to, anybody who wants to go off a thousand feet for a weekend under the sea, we can go a thousand feet any other direction pretty easily. There are two-person versions. There are three-person versions. This one operates in Costa Rica at Cocos Islands. It's so cool, a little clear bubble. Now, this has a chauffeur with two passengers. Kids have been on board these systems. It just looks like magic. You're not getting wet. And you look out, and you see fish looking in. It's just such a cool thing. We need fleets of these little submarines. Here's my next dream submarine, three-person systems that can go 1,000 meters, the one that the deep sea that I just previously on the screen goes to 500 meters. Again, we're beginning to see these aboard cruise ships for tourism. Scientists need to have access to the sea wherever we want to go. And it is coming. We have the technology. I just want to live another 100 years so I can see how it comes out. Why do we need to go into the sea? Now, we're celebrating coastal cities and coastal oceans at this conference. But we should definitely keep in mind that it's not just a fence that divides the coasts from the open ocean beyond. It, any more than your little finger operates all by itself. It's connected to the rest of the ocean. And understanding the deep sea beyond, understanding the nature of the ocean, the water that flows in along the coast and the water that goes from the coast on out to the sea. That has to be a priority. Looking at the whole world as one interacting system with human beings very much a part of what makes the world function as it does these days. Some of the corals that I got to see in another underfunded part of our national fleet of undersea technology access the Pisces subs at the University of Hawaii. We got to see the place close to where I made my dive in the gym suit, that walking suit that goes to 400 meters. This goes to as much as 2,000 meters beneath the surface. And we were looking at animals that have been aged to be as much as five, six, seven, thousand years old. Imagine what the world was like 7,000 years ago. Just imagine what humankind was doing 7,000 years ago. But think even more. Where will we be 7,000 years in the future? They'll still be out there, maybe. <laughs> maybe not. Who knows? But we have a chance during our time to get it right. It just pains me that my country, this country, with all of the strength of our engineering, our science, and our economy built on ingenuity, built on Yankee ingenuity, <laughs> solving problems that we 
are letting the lead slip away. Russia has six 6,000 meter submersibles available for science exploration and of course for some other uses that they don't talk about too much. Japan has a 6,500 meter sub and in October of this past year, I went to China to see the Sea Dragon, China's 7,000 meter sub. And they let me get inside and look out. Not when it was in the water, huh, maybe someday. But maybe someday we'll have 7,000, 10,000, 11,000 meter submersibles. Actually, there is one, and it's now at Woods Hole, because James Cameron, filmmaker extraordinaire, who says he has to make films once in a while so he can go diving, <laughs> go diving to the deepest place in the ocean, the current National Geographic that I just saw for the first time when I came in tonight, it's, on the, it's out right now, um, the shows on the cover, James Cameron, think Avatar, think Titanic, think Terminator, think whatever you want to think about James Cameron. He is an explorer, as well as being an artist and a storyteller. And he is showing what you know an individual can do without government support, with private initiative and private funding. The way Aquarius is gaining some traction because of private support, private ingenuity, private funding, and people who want to make it happen no matter what. Your marine laboratory, that's not just happening because somebody is writing a big taxpayer check. There are private individuals who are saying, we want this to work and it is working. That's the spirit that will take us where we need to go, onward and downward, as they say. Um, I love what my daughter and son-in-law are doing with a company that I started and building robots. Someday, I hope they'll get to do a 11,000 meter submarine to go down to find James Cameron's, not footprints, but subprints on the bottom of the ocean to be able to go exploring. If you can go to the deepest part of the ocean, you can go anywhere in the ocean. And we need to go. We need to see what's going on, to meet fish on their own terms. A lot of people see creatures such as these on a plate, calamari, yum yum. <laughs> but to connect the dots and know that if you love birds, if you love seals and sea lions and whales and dolphins and things, you'll kind of lay off the squids, give them a break so that the creatures who have no choices can enjoy them. We will get to know the greatest diversity of life on Earth by using our technology, exploring the ocean. There's a stomatopod, just so you know. <laughs> These smart creatures that are related to crabs and shrimp and things. There's so much that we have to dis discover and enrich our lives and give ourselves an insurance policy because if we know how our life support system works and the significance of the nuts, the bolts, the cogs, the wheels, as Aldo Leopold referred to, the diversity of life, the species that make planet Earth function, and you'll recognize, with, as with cats and dogs, horses and birds and people, they're all different. The DNA of that fish is different from another one of its species, because it's like a fingerprint. They all have their own special place and face. Getting to know that wherever you see them in the ocean. Creatures as colorful, as important, maybe even more important to our life support system than birds. And birds, we now know, are important to keeping us alive. But knowing that fish have faces somehow creates a different attitude. Sure, fish taste good, birds taste good. We have Kentucky Fried birds, we have Christmas birds and Thanksgiving birds, but we don't eat songbirds anymore. We have ducks sometimes that are taken for an occasional meal, but we don't just take all birds. We don't have Kentucky Fried bird. We don't have a mammal burger, or maybe we do, I'm <laughs> not sure. But we have fish and chips. What kind of fish? You know, we don't even care. And we need to care. We need to understand. We have that capacity now to put ourselves in the loop and not think of 
fish, whether it's a barracuda or a grouper or a cod, either as a commodity or as an enemy. When I started diving in the ocean, I was told to watch out for the sharks because there are man-eaters out there, and then I realized I didn't have to worry about that, not being a man. Um, <laughs> but now we know that sharks really do have to worry about us. There are a lot of us eating sharks, and not just the little guys either, but the biggest fish in the sea is now fair game for humans. Now, they don't <laughs> want to eat us, of course. They like plankton. And now we're beginning to see that sharks are beautiful creatures, and they're shark watchers. They're people who pay big bucks to go swim with sharks. But that's coincident with the time that sharks are in real trouble. About 90% of the sharks are gone, and it's happened since I began diving. We love to kill sharks because we thought, think of them as the bad guys, and because there's a market for their fins because there's a market for the cartilage, there's a market for their steaks. And we're stripping the ocean because now we can. We couldn't do what we, you know, going back to BB's time, didn't have the technology to find them or to market them. True too with tuna. <laughs> you see in the grocery stores, tuna helper, we need to give tuna help because they are in trouble. When I first went to the Seychelles in the 1960s, there were no tuna fishermen. When I went back in the 90s, there were big trawlers like this and long lines all over the place, stripping the life out of even that distant ocean. If you haven't been to see the Tokyo fish market and want to see a scene like this, you better hurry. Because according to the latest news that came just a couple weeks ago, 96% of the bluefin tuna in the Pacific are gone since the 1970s. When I was chief scientist at NOAA, they said 90% of the bluefin tuna in the Atlantic were gone. That was 1990. They haven't improved since then. Or think Southern Hemisphere, think deep water, where for the first time we're extracting these little guys. You know, they're not very big, but it takes 30 years for them to mature. They may live more than a century. And you can do them in in about 20 minutes on a plate with lemon slices and butter. Orange roughy. To catch them means killing these giant forests of coral. Again, think thousands of years that are sacrificed. Think of the animals themselves. I don't think you can justify this on the basis of need, because we haven't, in all of our history, had access to these populations before. It's a choice. Now, coastal communities all over the world, cities have prospered, thrived taking wildlife, whether it was whales, seals, or fish, even penguins, to some extent, in the southern hemisphere, in the right places at the right time. But now we know that this is simply not sustainable. Something that lives 100 years, takes 30 years to mature, doesn't reproduce every year. What are we thinking? We're stripping the ocean using industrial scale techniques. Now we know better. It's, we really have to catch up with doing better and think about how we can still consume, see life, things we like to eat, still have those choices, but do it so that they and we can survive. Whales are still taken for food as commodities by a, a few countries, but by and large we've seen other values. We've seen the importance of whales alive economic importance as well as ecological importance. Now, like no other generation before the present time, we can think about how one part of the planet affects all parts of the planet. What happens here in the northeastern part of this country is affected by what happens in Antarctica. Oops, didn't mean to do that. <laughs> it isn't just the birds in Antarctica that are affected. Part of what we're doing to Antarctica, part of what we're doing everywhere in the world, is owing to our relatively new appetite for energy that, oh, by the way, has made it possible for us to be 7 billion people and climbing with cities all over the world that you can now see from space. And you can see just in this image the outlines along the coastal areas where the lights shine most brightly. We have the capacity to look 
at what we're doing, to measure what we're doing, whether it's in the Antarctic or here in the Arctic, the diminishing of the Arctic ice every summer, becoming increasingly open at both poles. Bad news for polar bears, bad news for coastal cities, bad news for people everywhere. And yet we hunger for the oil and gas and coal, and we will continue one way or the other to draw down those assets with consequences that were not intended. But now we know, and we're beginning to understand that the need to access the deep sea so that when a problem like this happens, we'll know what to do about it. We'll be able to assess the damage to the floating golden forests in the Gulf of Mexico, in the Sargasso Sea, the impacts on these systems as oxygen generators, as carbon dioxide absorbers. Not just what we're taking out of the ocean, also what we're putting in. I don't have to say anything to this audience because you know you go to the coast, you see the accumulation of what we put into the sea coming back to haunt us. Know that it is doing its own way of taking wildlife from the sea inadvertently with drift nets that go on drifting, bottles that go on catching. This is a good news story, quickly. This dolphin I met just a year ago in the Bahamas. It came over to visit. You can see the deep cut in its tail. It had been tangled and untangled by humans. And he was basically coming back to strangers. And some might say he's coming back to see, to, you know, it's a stretch to say he was, came back to say thank you. But he did come and hang out with us. He had been given a break by one of us. These kids, good news. They're out there taking some of the plastic that we've allowed to go into the ocean and dragging it back to shore. These kids in South Africa are taking a pledge. They're going to take care of the ocean. These kids who are participating in rehabilitating at the other end of the world, penguins that have been damaged and introducing them back to the ocean. Plenty of reasons for hope, these kids in Hong Kong, who are taking the pledge that they will take care of sharks. Hong Kong is like the black hole for the market for shark fins. Plenty of reasons for hope. And I'm standing in a room with lots of reasons for hope. And I want to salute the university. I want to salute all of you for being so smart to have been born at this sweet spot in time, and also for doing what you're doing. We can't bring back the monk seals that once were in the Gulf of Mexico as far north as Galveston. There were some when I was in high school. They're all gone. But you still have seals that are beginning to repopulate areas here. Some regard them as pests. But it's a sign of good news that seals are once again finding this part of the Northeast a safe haven, almost safe, safer than it has been in times past. I just want to end with, with this little glimpse of a bird I met a year ago who is known to be 62 years old. She lives halfway across the Pacific, not exactly a neighbor here, but she does fly over thousands of miles every year to pick up squid and small fish to feed herself. Her mate does the same. They tend to mate for life, like some humans. And they feed their single chick. She's sitting on her latest egg. And I sat with her for a while, just imagining what she had witnessed over the last half century plus. Because you know she was just learning to fly about the same time I was learning to dive. Think about the changes that have taken place. The fact that she can't know why those changes are taking place or what to do about it, even if she knew. But we know that's why we have plenty of reason for hope on this little blue speck in the universe. Thank you.
Well, thank you so much, Sylvia, for a very inspiring, compelling talk. Um, I want to thank you all for coming tonight and uh, for wishing us well in our ventures here and hope that you'll participate uh, as we go forward. And I just want to finish off by thanking uh, Stan Berber and his wife Janet for providing some financial support that made this evening possible and wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. <laughs>